recording. Hello YouTube. Uh, we're starting now with day eleven. So, so uh, your plane lands with plenty of time to spare. The final leg of your journey is a ferry that goes um, directly to the tropical island where you can finally start your vacation. As you reach the waiting area to board the ferry, you realize you're so early, nobody else has uh, even arrived yet. By modeling the process people used to choose or abandon their seat in the waiting area. Hey, to step. Hello. Hi. So, um, by modeling the process people used to choose or abandon their seat in the waiting area, you're pretty sure you can predict the best place to sit. You make a quick map of the seat layout, your puzzle input. Um, the seat layout fits neatly on a grid. Every position is either floor or an empty seat or an occupied seat. For example, the initial seat layout may look like this. Okay, so these are all empty, I guess. Yeah, like the L for an empty seat is such a nice symbol. <laughs> That's funny. Um, now you just need to model uh, the people who will be arriving shortly. Fortunately, people are entirely predictable and always follow a simple set of rules. Nice. Uh, I'm working on, re on rewriting this one using complex numbers. Have fun. Okay. Uh, all decisions are based on the number of occupied seats adjacent, adjacent to a given seat. Uh, one of the eight positions immediately up, left, down, right, or diagonal from the seat. The following rules are applied. Oops, and my T, I think, is done. So, uh, as I was saying, blah, 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 if a seat is empty there are no, and there are no occupied seats adjacent to it, the seat becomes occupied. If a seat is occupied and four or more seats adjacent to it are also occupied, the seat becomes empty. This is like a inverse game of life. <laughs> too real, though. Way too real. <laughs> Otherwise, the, size, the seat uh, state doesn't change. Okay, so, I mean, fine. The floor never changes, seat don't move, and nobody sits on the floor. After one round of these rules, every seat in the example layout becomes occupied. Right, because every seat is empty, so then everything becomes occupied. But now some places are crowded, some places aren't. Four or more, so 50% of the adjacent space needs to be filled. Okay, so after the second round, the seats with four more spots and blah 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 will become empty again. And this process continues for three more rounds until you reach, uh, I guess, a steady state. At this point, something interesting happens. The chaos stabilizes, and further application of these rules causes no change state. Uh, no, yeah, no change state. Once people stop moving around, you count 37 occupied seats. Simulate your sitting area by applying the sitting rules repeatedly until no seats change. How many seats end up occupied? Um, okay, that's that's an interesting day. One thing that I have to note is that, um, well, I guess it depends partially on the rules. I wonder, I I really wonder if it's a property of the rules or a property of the rules plus the, um, the layout. No, it's definitely a property of the rules plus the layout that will be given because there can be other steady states like a blinking state. And, and that's why I concluded that it, it needs to be also supported by the map. Like if you have a map where everything is empty seats, like everything is seats, there is no floor. You start where everything is empty, then everything fills up. Oh, but no, not everything will uh, die the next round that's interesting because there are borders unless you like consider it infinite. So, okay, that's interesting. Um, in any case, so this is uh, telling us that we can just check that the state doesn't change. Although this is not always the case because sometimes you can have blinking stuff and I think even longer paths of um, like a, a loop that, that is not just one thing always and nor a blinking thing, but also maybe like three different states that you keep cycling through. Uh, but to know which is which, it uh, like depends on the rules and everything else. I, and 
been too long since I've done uh, control theory to really remember, even if you can like analyze this stuff easily. Uh, so whatever. Um, okay, let's grab the puzzle input. Okay, pretty big waiting area. Holy shit. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. so we want the 11 i'll keep the 10 open in case i need to steal some ideas and uh oops i mean i minimized it uh let the typos begin copy paste save um it's Okay, do we have a new line at the end? Do we want a new line at the end? I think I'm good. So, A10, no, A11. Cons data is, uh, by the way, writing is one using complex number. How do you do this with complex numbers? I have no idea. What do you encode in the Oh, I guess. I guess every complex number is a block of cells, not just a cell. It's a block of cells, and in the imaginary part, you encode. Which position you're in, I have no idea. <laughs> I really have no idea. Um, in any case, embed file, uh, it's these. Uh, also, why is this? Why is this eating my at? This is so buggy. Like, I'm pretty sure I wrote the at, and then I wrote em embed file, and the at disappears. What? So buggy, kind of disappointed. Um, okay. So we have the seats. <clears throat> we definitely need to read this as a as a matrix, I think. Um, I th I really think we need to this as a as a matrix and to use complex numbers store x and y as complex as y in a map oh i see i clearly have no idea uh but then what do you get from that or x is right in a map like what what do you get from the complex part of it Because I mean, if you just wanted to store a, cup, a tuple of coordinates in a map, you could still do that, no? In a bunch of ways. So that's, that's I guess, my question. Um, in any case, so let's start reading. RIT. Mem. Tokenize. Data. The new line. Oops. Uh. Oh. New line. So I just simplify things a bit. Rather than always using X and Y pairs, also there are ways you can rotate a complex number by multiplication. I can find that right now. Yeah, I was thinking something of the sort, clearly in a, in a very like wishy washy way. Okay, so I think I understand what you're saying. So, like, this, this would all allow you to express more cleanly uh, going up, left, right, and diagonally. By one. Oh, uh, I can see that getting messy in my in this version. Okay, so um, how do we do this? Well, how wide is this thing? Ninety-six characters selected. So we are ninety-six wide. Uh, which means that should I do a slice of of rows? This is gonna make going by column annoying though. But I think it should be still doable. Okay, let, let's do 
let's start with a slice of rose. I have no idea if it's a good idea, honestly. We'll we'll see how it goes. So, <clears throat> uh, while and also, why am I tokenizing on new lines? Do I want to do this, or should I just read character by character? Uh, let's do let's let's keep doing the lines i maybe it's um maybe it's useless uh stuff that i'm doing on top but at least i know it works uh, okay so line um i was saying we want uh i guess we want an array list because we don't know how many rows there are going to be well okay actually i can know it's 99 rows so um so you know what var it's a 99 uh, var uh, seats is a um or it should be slots i don't know well let's call it seats i don't know um it's an array of 99 96 was it the row correct 96 characters okay so 99 by 96 um, 96 watts. 96 watts. I think we should prepare an enum. We could probably do an optional boolean. Should we do an optional boolean or should we do an enum? I think we can do an enum. Const it state an enum. Uh, we have um floor empty occupied so we have a bunch of seed states and this is type the find and then for four seats row four row seat and we want a pointer to the seat and actually I think we want a pointer to the row do do we do we want a pointer to the row I think we do, right? Because if we try to do this without making this a pointer, we might be getting a pointer to the copy. Like, and I think Ziggy is gonna make this, gonna force us, is gonna make this a const pointer. So we should get an error actually if we try. But yeah, we need this to be a pointer. So, and I think I can cycle to the pointer. Yes, I can. Um, okay, so. This should be this should be it. And in here also did I did I lose my thing? No, okay. It just stopped complete for some reason. Why is it not collapsing everything? I expected the GFMT to collapse everything. Um so we have our seat and what do we do with the seat? Uh we set it to I J, we don't need to connect anymore. So we set I J to uh what do we read? So seed dot star equals data where is so it's the number of it's um I should probably make a function for this. Which could be useful anyway. You know what? Do I do I really want the do I really want this structure? Maybe I don't even want this structure. Does it matter? Probably doesn't even matter much. Oh maybe this will catch a bunch of errors for me. We'll we'll see. Maybe maybe it, it does help. Um so from from data we want to read um 
So if i is 0 and j is 0, if, well, if j is 1 or 5, or if it's, if it's the first row, we want uh, 96 times the row plus j. I think that's it, right? Simple as that. And so for in the beginning is zero, then one, two, three, up until ninety five. Oh wait, wait, yeah, I think it is ninety six. We cannot forget that this original thing without organizing has new lines. Oh man. So I think I do want tokenization, otherwise I would have to skip these every single time. Um, yep, I totally do want that. RIT equals mm. Oh, these new lines annoying. Why did you not go how to complete this? Please, data. Thank you. Um. Okay, so we do tokenize so that we can get rid of that and for and while it dot next. Actually, no, we can we can keep doing this. Just that uh, we need to do const line equals it dot next. Dot question mark. We assert that the line is going to be there, and then for each character in line. We get the character, we get the index, and we set what? But we got a pointer to the row, <laughs> so we just need to we just need to do row plot j plus c. Oh, that's not bad actually. That's not bad. So we, we grab the first row, we grab the first line, and then we put everything in there. And then we do this until the end. Okay, so this seems nice. Um, we could even start running it just to make sure we don't have like a weird pointer shenanigans. So CD. Uh, or like more, more precisely, index shenanigans. Zig build day eleven. Error expected type six. Wait, oh, that's a good point. Of course, we have to switch over C and decide from there. I could even, <laughs> you know, I could even make this an enum and. But anyway, um, so let's switch C. Um, so if you have a dot, you want to return dot floor. If you have a L, you want to return dot empty. If you get a pound sign, return dot occupy. Now characters. Also have some can also be something else. If we get something else, panic, bad face. We should not ever get here. Or you know what? The the better way would be that this is un this is unreachable. We do not expect to be ever be able to reach there. So what we want now. Um. Okay, so this should compile. No. Oh yeah, uh, this needs to be a normal comma. Um, I want to search for first new line and make seed sizes based on that. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm I, I'm a bit of a cheater in that regard. Like I, I look at the input and I just counted the number of characters using Sublime and I just R-coded that. 
Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to use the sample data. Do you do you do I really need the sample data? Okay, I, I get your point. You know what? I in other days I always made the decision: do I uh, on whether I need to first try out the sample data or not? And if it's something that I don't feel confident uh, about at all, I try out the sample data first. Uh, but in this case, I don't feel like it. That said, we probably will. I don't I don't expect this to compile. First try, so we'll see. Um, if if it ends up getting there, I'll you know I'll just make these two variables and uh, derive them from 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 the file or whatever. I mean, in any case, it's just two places, right? And it would, like the um, the shape of the data doesn't show up anywhere else, so this should be should, this should be fine because I'm gonna treat these as as slices, I think, uh, going forward. So. Um, so this is the empty state, and yeah, and so this is the starting point where everything is empty. Now we need to uh, we need to tick. So here's the thing. Um, I'm gonna this should instead of being called seeds, I think this should be called original seeds, or actually just original, or like starting state. Start. Let's call it start. Because this is the original state. So what we want to do now is have a is have a um, wait. Why am I not just modifying this one? Let me think about it. Why am I not just modifying it? I don't know. Whatever. J just for cleanliness. Let's let's call it start. Then we have a copy, which is going to be uh, we have current and prev. So. Rev is start, and then oh, let's call it next. Uh, next now is gonna be uh, I guess tick. I'm gonna make it a function. Should I, should I make it a function? Yes, it's useful to make it a function so that I can kick start next here and then um, do every, the rest in a while loop. So uh, next is ticking over. Uh, well, I guess prev. And then after I have this, I do while next is different than prev. While it's different. And this is, I think, super slow because I could probably know if I never applied any rule, if I never made any transformation in tick instead of of doing this you know what i think this is so this is probably not gonna take too long but this feels so bad why am i checking everything every time it's nice to say this in a declarative approach right i have the two states but let's try to make this i don't know i feel like making this slightly more efficient uh maybe maybe it's like a useless optimization you know um these inputs are not gigantic and cpus are absurdly fast so uh it, it's not needed but let's do this in any case so here's what i'm gonna do uh okay let's go back to seats can i do this in place oh no, right that's the problem because i can't do this in place no 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 let's not try to do this stuff in place bad idea uh okay no we keep next and prev but um But here's what we do. Here's what we do. Here is what we do. Uh, var date equals start. And then we keep doing this. We do var while true. Date equals tick date. Now, the reason why it, this is not in place, okay? What, what, I was, what I was thinking originally is that I would give a pointer and I would modify the thing itself, but this is not in place. And um, what do you think, what you need to be um, aware of, of what I'm doing here that is non obvious, is that I'm using arrays, I'm not using slices. So I'm moving around. Uh, 
big chunk of data every single time. So this is basically going to produce a copy, a different array that in, is then is going to be mem copied in here, basically. Kinda. There we have result semantics in Zig. But the point is, if I were trying to do this with slices, this wouldn't work because it would actually be uh like i uh, i would be trying to use the same underlying memory but i'm not because i'm moving around actual arrays so with that in mind this is the the, the thing oh and, and the, um the reason why i'm doing while well through is because i expect tick to explode uh well, i expect tick to basically uh error out, not error out but like uh, exit the program when no transformations could have been applied uh so that way i skip the expensive uh check every single time so i'm gonna leave it as a comment uh maybe here uh tick is expected to uh exit the program when no, no rule uh could be applied well not exactly no rule when no transformation because technically nothing changes uh, given certain conditions is a rule. It's just not a transformation or you know what I mean. I would say that's precise enough. So function tick. Tick takes in, okay, um, takes in a prev, which is this, and returns a new copy of that same thing. Okay, so var next equals uh, next of type this equals undefined. So this is gonna be a return value. Uh, now we apply the rules. Um, so the rules are for each square, we need to count the neighbors basically. So let's do a neighbor counting routine. Neighbors, our neighbors. The neighbors is gonna be. I, I probably need a block here. So, what do we do in neighbors? Um, oh, and for uh, next. For each pointer to a row, and I think we need also the index of this row, and for row eight, so for each row and seat, why am I not getting any What happened to my big format? Oh man. I think LSP made made sublime way too janky. Okay. Um so as I was saying, here we're doing we're doing this. Oh no, I lost it. Oh fuck it. Okay, I'll <laughs> just retype it. Var um well no. Const ne neighbors is block whatever um so we have the index and i guess we need to do the transformations for x and y so um, how do we do this? Let me think a good way of doing this. I think we should put, I should put these things in a tuple, like Like operations is a the tuple that contains the 
it contains an array of two thing of two uh i don't know my size minus one minus one minus one minus one minus one zero minus one plus one then zero minus one zero plus one zero zero will be us and then plus one minus one plus one zero plus one plus one so these are the transformations and also you know what this doesn't even have to be typed like this i think i could just make it i think i could just do it like this i would have to inline a bunch of stuff but hey that's fine uh, that's totally fine i don't care so we have the we have the neighbors and here we do var and size equals zero and then in line for operations have an operation and we do um bar x equals i plus p zero bar wait why is it var const const uh y is is j plus op one so i'm applying the two transformations that i wanted to apply better something found something else uh where are you okay? Line thirty-eight. Why you don't like this? Oh, it's. I guess it's the plus one that. Right, <laughs> plus one doesn't work. Um. Uh, okay, this one. Okay, now we're good. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, these are gonna these are the coordinates that we're checking and we are only checking them if uh, uh, if um, well if x is what we want to do if x is greater than greater or equal than zero and x is lower than 99 or is it is it 99 i think i'm i'm messing around with x and y's you know i think give me a second why i is the y and x is the j yes i mean it doesn't matter why right? i can call them whatever i want it's, it, but i need to make sure that i map them to the right thing here so usually x is the, is the horizontal axis so i'm making sure that like i don't want to get confused afterwards so it need, x needs to be lower than 96 and y needs to be greater and equal than zero and y needs to be lower than 99. so we need to make sure that we are in in the right range if we are in, in, a, in a range where we can access uh, the array then we can do uh, 
we can do and um if actually no switch um we want to switch over prev y x yep and and what we want to do is um If it's a uh, dot occupied, we want to do, or we want to do n plus one, I guess. Otherwise, we don't do anything. So let's do it like this: n plus equals which it's occupied. We return one. Otherwise, we return zero. Now this is a good moment to go check the rules because do I, is it enough to count the occupied seats? I think there was also, is the floor doing any special thing about it? So if a seat is empty and there are no occupied seats adjacent to it, the seat becomes occupied. If the seat is occupied and there are four or more seats adjacent to it that are also occupied, the seat becomes empty. Otherwise the seat state doesn't change. Okay, so these are the rules. So here, also another thing that I can do is like I can get a the current seat, I guess. I can get the current seat, and I can do the I, like if the current seat is floor. By the way, we don't need to, we don't need to do anything. So here's what we can do. Okay, so here we are counting the neighbors. But here's what we can do at, at the outer layer. So we can switch the state of the seat. So seat dot star. Tell me what the state of the seat is. And if the state is floor, we don't do anything. You're done. If the seat is um is occupied or empty, or I guess it's else, else, and in, in the else case we do stuff, so in this other case we need to count the neighbors, we don't do it otherwise, because if, again, if the seat is not actually a seat but it's floor, then we're done, and in the else branch, we count the neighbors, yes, So we do the inline for the, all the operations, and if the index makes sense, then we count plus one. Also, this is not in a percentage. This is a is a absolute count, which means that in the corners, basically the corners are more easy that they stay occupied. Uh, that, yeah, that they stay occupied because they have like default always empty spots uh, on the corner sides. So. We get the count of the neighbors. Uh, if see the floor continue, uh, yeah, that's another way of doing it. I I don't know. I like this one. I I didn't like the 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 early bail. You know what? Another thing uh, to step the one other reason I guess why I'm doing this is because I cannot use the early bail rule inside of here. Because here I could say if we are outside of the bounds, we then continue, right? We bail immediately in this case. The problem is that. Uh, I think that continue break and stuff, etc., are broken for inline for loops. I don't remember the precise rules, but like this stuff is not yet working. We need self-hosted for this to work. So um, I don't want to hit compiler errors. So I decided to go for the nested version for the non-early uh, exit version in here, and I wanted to be consistent outside. That that's pretty much it. But yeah, that would work too. So um, in this other case, and I think you're right, actually, you know what? It might be so much nicer that it's worth doing it. Mm. We'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah, it's like it's, I guess it's stylistic choices at the end, right? Um, plus, 
uh, being aware of compiler bugs. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, is this counting the neighbors correctly? I think it is, right? Yes, if it's occupied with a plus one, otherwise we don't do anything. Okay, so now we have the neighbors. Now we have to decide our, our own state. I guess I can switch again. But switching again, I think it's not going to remove this option. It's annoying. I can, I can do a if, I guess, if C star is floor. Or maybe I should switch neighbors first. Maybe I should switch neighbors and say, can I, can you have unbounded ranges in switch cases? Ranges can be specified with the dot, dot, dot syntax. These are including on both ends. So I think you do need uh, I, think, I guess you do need but uh, there is no problem so let me think I know we are not floor well um, okay I don't know I'm, I'm curious let me try switching on neighbors uh, is Maybe it's a bad idea. I have no idea. So let's switch on neighbors. And we say, if neighbors is zero, and these, and we know that this seat is not, um, is not floor, then we can say that this seat is occupied unconditionally. Maybe it was already occupied and it stays occupied if so. If neighbors, is from one to three inclusive right let me double check yeah inclusive on both ends so if c is one through three then it everything is unchanged i believe we don't need to do anything there uh else so if it's four or more then seat becomes empty. Now, did I did I do that right? Expect a semicolon found closing parentheses. Uh, like this? No. What am I missing? Wait, I should check the line. Yes, 60, 65. Expected semicolon. Oh, this, yeah. Okay. Um, is this correct? Let me double check the rules. If I said it is empty and there are no occupied seats adjacent to it, it becomes occupied. If a seat is occupied and four or more seats adjacent to it, it becomes empty. Well, the this if and if a seat is empty thing, like this is useless, I think. Because, uh, yeah, I can, uh, yeah, I can always do max int, I guess. But I think this is good enough. Like we, we just restrict, like we just make the central do nothing thing uh, a case, and then we can use else, and we're done. So also, I forgot to break. Break. ELK with N. Okay. So, so it doesn't have to be empty because if it's occupied and there are no occupied seats to it, it stays occupied. And, yep. If the seat is occupied, well, I don't know. I mean, I think okay. In, in any case, no, I think this is right to say here. But like, we can, we we can like, um, how can I say? This is not a one-to-one -one mapping to the rule here, but I think it's still compatible. That's my point. Um, if a seat is occupied and four or more seats adjacent to it are also occupied, the seat becomes empty. Yes, if neighbors is four or more, 
Otherwise, the seed state doesn't change. And I think we should be good. Floor never changes, seed don't move, and nobody sits on the floor. Okay, so now the question is... Now, here we need to do something more, though. Here we need to say... Well, yes, this is now occupied, but also we need to do var uh, changed is false. But we need to say that here we did make a change. And same with this, we did make a change here. Please, climb, why so buggy? God damn it. So here too, we made a change, so we put it to true. Now, after we're done with everything, so what do we need to return? We need to return how many seats end up occupied. So what we can do here is also bar occupied. Every tick occupied is a new size, uh, is a Susie that starts at zero. New season. The Susie that starts at zero. And <clears throat> oh, and we totally need to add to it if it's occupied. So, okay. Uh, if. This is not super clean and efficient. It could be nicer. Like if we didn't do this thing, we like if we switch properly, whatever. It can make it can be made <laughs> more elegant where we only like switch on seat once and we do everything that we need to do in each particular case. But whatever. Um, I'm I'm just trying to make things work for me for this uh, for this challenge and not produce the best code possible. So if the seat happens to be um occupied then we do occupied plus equals one we increase it by one so we increase the counter for every tick we do this and if we get at the end of the for loop if we get here um uh, did we each the steady state so if not changed, then we print uh, final count count new line, uh, <laughs> and we print dot occupied, and we should be almost good because now we need to interrupt interrupt the loop. So to interrupt the loop, we can do just, um, I guess, scd os.exit. I could panic. Like, well, you know what? Let's do it. Unreachable. We should not ever get here, but we will, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Let's catch the compile errors. Error cannot cast negative value minus one to oh god again this thing ah oh, man again again this thing how do we do this I don't know as I size I don't know as I sixteen. as I seen expect the ICC found you size so I can just do as uh, int cast I have to say I need to get smarter at understanding this cast yeah and now it complains on the other side which is understandable but now uh, int cast back to you size Actually, you know what? Maybe these casts are actually necessary as they are. And I'm complaining about something that is actually 
that I think I'm not doing correctly and I'm and I think I'm I'm doing oh god and I think I'm doing uh, some kind of uh bad workaround to make things compile but actually this is how this is what you were so you are supposed to do anyway just maybe picking something better than I, a random i16 so cannot store in time value of constant time from time int what What? Come again? Cannot store runtime value in type com time int. No? What are you talking about? N is a U size. It's a Susie. Sig? N it's a Susie. Why why can't I put one in there? As Is U size? Is this better? Okay, expected type 99 found void. Oh yeah, am I am I returning? Return next. Nice. Panic during a panic. I've tend to cast a negative value to unsigned integer. Uh right, because this happens before the check and we do go negative sometimes. So um how do we fix this i guess we fix this like this you know what we have to fix it at the at the consumption point where which makes sense yeah uh actually this is legitimate like right here we will end up producing negative stuff the point the point where we can safely cast back to unsigned is only when we are checked that we are positive That's a good point. We are looping a lot. That's not great. Uh oh. We are looping a lot, and I think we should print here how long have we have been looping for. So far, I. So zero, and every time we loop, print. Print, I guess, I on a new line. So if we are looping too much, it means that we're applying the rules in the wrong way. Oh, and yeah, there's another reasonable point. I should be increased. <laughs> That is a lot of loops. I think that's definitely too many loops. I don't think this really needs 50,000 loops. I mean, the input space is kind of big, but seriously, this much? you know what i'm gonna take 100k as the limit where yeah we probably definitely did something wrong okay <laughs> not like this <laughs> yeah it doesn't look good i agree so there must be a bug somewhere um so here's the interesting thing i think that whatever bug is in here i think there are some small chances there are some small chances that the the bug is because I'm not just checking that the two arrays are the same. And instead when trying to be fancy, it changed maybe. In any case, so this doesn't seem to be working. And you know what I'm starting to think? I'm starting to think that 
two step was right and maybe we should have um maybe we should have used the uh sample input honestly i was hoping to get this kind of right first try i mean not everything but like the, the i didn't expect to have bugs in the general rule applying algorithm this is kind of disappointing so hmm Okay, here's what I will do. I'll try, I'll read again the neighbors part here. I'll double check a couple of things just to make sure they make sense. And if this doesn't work, I I really hope that, like there is not a bug here about no, this cannot be a bug. I I really don't think this can be a bug. In any case, um yeah, I'll double check the neighbor counting algorithm and maybe I could print, try to print the neighbors that we uh, end up observing over time. And um, and maybe that is going to be a good hint enough. I mean, this is probably the place where it's easier to get stuff wrong. But if not, I think I'll... I have to buy the bullet and and try out uh, the the simplified input. So let's see. Let's try not to go over one hour and a half with this exercise. Um, so neighbors, we start with zero neighbors, and for each operation, which is right minus one minus one minus one zero minus one plus one. Yes. And is zero for y and one for x well it doesn't matter because they should be they should be interchangeable like like this set of things is symmetric so it, it doesn't even matter which we map to x and which we map to y i mean the order here is like top left corner and then we go around but um well for you the camera it would be like this. what we are doing i think no no it's like row 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 whatever but the, but the point is it, it like the order doesn't matter we're just summing summing things up So, one thing that we could do is, you know, here we could say print check. Well, we could do this um, print L. Tell whatever. Uh, and then we want to give uh, 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 J, J, comma, y, uh, I, yeah, comma, I. Uh, so this is our cell. And then here we, we do check. And we print x and y so let's see that these x and y's make sense for the cell so cell 46 31 checking 45 30 46 30 47 30 45 31 we don't check 46 31 because that's us then we check 47 31 yes and then we check 45, 32, 46, 32, 47, 32. So this checking algorithm, like, or at least like the coordinates are correct. So this seems correct. We are producing every time, I think the right number of neighbors. Justin Keller, hi, hello, welcome to the stream. Um, I'm solving the advent of code for today. So what are we missing? Why is changed never true? 
Sorry, why is change never false? Here's why change is never false. I found my error, I think. So, I'm an idiot. Here's what happened. I simplified the rule application and I was saying that my simplified version of applying the rules is compatible with the original version of applying the rules. And that is indeed true. So for example, here I'm saying, if there are zero neighbors, we set the seat to occupied. But if the seat was already occupied, we are not applying a transformation. So I simplified the rule application and that interacted with my <laughs> optimized way of noticing if uh, something changed. So here, what I'm doing is that I, at one point, I keep setting the seat to occupied when it's already occupied and same here, but actually I didn't change anything. And I keep thinking that I changed stuff when actually I didn't. And that's the problem. And actually, you know what? We can even see this like this, I think. Here's what I'm doing. I'm just printing the final count. Well, I'm printing the count, it's not final. I'm gonna keep, keep printing the count and you will see that it changes. And at one point it should stabilize to one, uh, uh, to one final count, which is when you reach the final state. And that's it. Let's see. Or maybe not. Am I not, am I, wait, am I not increasing occupied? Why is this never true? Print. Actually. Panic. It. Okay. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. <laughs> uh, why does it seem I never set any unreachable code? Yes, sorry. Uh, why does it look like I never set stuff? Okay, I did it. Okay, so that does happen. How can it be the final count zero though? Is this really it? Okay, so you know what? Let me let me do this. Let me fix this code here. So if seat is um, empty, then we, we set it to occupied and we correctly say that we, we did change something. I don't know why, but I preferred it on the second line. While here, we do kind of the same, except that if it's occupied, we put it back to empty. And here we say change through. So now this should finally include, final, but it says final count zero, which is kind of interesting. Why does it say that? And it, it says that, wait, and do I still have the loop count? Yes. Why does it say that in the first loop? What the hell? Why does he say that in the first loop? That, that doesn't make any sense. So change starts at false. If we apply any change, does occupied get increased? It should. Oh, wait. We are. Oh, uh, occupied gets increased based on prev. I occupy. I. Oh, wait a second. I'm an idiot. So that's a good point. Occupied gets increased. Yes, but it's being, a, oh my God. Why am I such an idiot? Why am I checking the new uh, thing? I should check, I should be checking prev. So uh, I should be checking prev. I should be checking prev i j. Thank you. 
So this should fix the count, although the, the bug is still there though, because now Occupied will have a have the proper value set. The problem is why does this thing think that we never applied any rule in the first loop? If seat is empty, oh god, you know why? Because I'm doing the same stupid shit there. I should be checking prev, not the new one. There we go. Yep, so here I was checking prev properly. Here I wasn't checking prev properly. And I think that should be better. So now it's, it loops for a while. Hopefully it stops at one point. <laughs> Have I, have I messed up? Probably have messed up. Uh, out of curiosity, okay, let I want to see also. I want to see the count as we move forward. Interesting. It ke it keeps flipping from. I guess it's from empty to field. It keeps flipping from empty to field. That's kind of weird. Do I have another bug based on seed star somewhere else? Uh, so let's see what other bugs could we have in here? Am I using the right coordinates? Coordinates? Yes, it's always I and J. That is correct. Um, next is undefined. Prep is what we get. State starts at start. Yes, and occupied is always this number. If it's lower, if it's floor. Is there anything that we need to do in here that we skip on floor? No, we don't need to count neighbors. We don't need to modify anything because, because in any case, this seat is if, if it's floor, it's not going to change. So this is a correct, like early bail. Neighbors, we do count the neighbors correctly, I think. Well, at least we check the right coordinates and I think the counting happens correctly too. Then we switch on the value of neighbors. We check what was there and if it was occupied and neighbors were zero, then we, we flip it and we say changed was true. If it's between one and three, we do nothing. We don't even flip change. We don't, we really do not do anything. If it's more than four, well, if it's four or more, if that seat was occupied, are X and Y flipped? Um, I was thinking about this. I don't think they are. Why I read by row, the Y is the vertical axis and X being the inner one is the horizontal axis. So I don't think they are flipped. Once y equals j, oh god, where do I have y equals j? No, no, I don't have that. I have i is the other loop. Yeah, no, I mean, um, this is what I want. Unless I, uh, unless I got confused about this too, so I'll, I'll think about it a little bit more. Well, that's what I want. The, these, as I said, I, re I read everything by row. So by reading by row, you get the Y on the outer part of the array, right? First row has index zero. Next row has index, well, as I equals zero. Second, uh, second row has I equals one. So that's your, ends up being your Y. And within one row, you have 
the other one. And also, you know what? I never get out of bounds error. So I think I, since the two dimensions are not equal, I think I'm getting this right. Um, what else could it be? Maybe I should do this. You know what? Just out of curiosity, var temp state var and then state equals temp. Is this better? I don't think so, but I just wanted to double check. Okay, we can go back to the other thing. Yeah, I I, I didn't expect Z to get this wrong. Um, so why are we flipping this much? The answer is. Flipping from zero to full, I, I'm, I don't know for certain if that's full, but I'm assuming that is indeed full. And flipping from zero to full, or you know what, let's momentarily hack this and say different than uh, floor. So this should tell me the total number of seats. Okay, so 9504 is the number of non-floor seats. So the, uh, wait, this is actually full. 9504 is full. Let's see, that is indeed interesting. So these are the seats that are not floor. Interesting. So that's not the same number. So going back to these, here's what I want to do. Tell me how many occupies are there um if i equals um equals one uh what do you want to do if i equals zero it's the first loop if i equals one is the second loop so if i equals one unreachable okay so it goes from zero to seventy eight eleven I'm an idiot. And here we finally solve the riddle. Here, here's the final bug. Here I'm counting the neighbors. And here, wait, that is correct. I thought I was doing this the, the uh, for a second, I thought I was doing the, the, this the opposite. So here I'm counting the occupied slots. No, and this is correct then. If there are zero occupied slots next to it, then it becomes occupied. Fuck, I thought I <laughs> had it backwards and that would have been the final fix. But it's weird, no? Why am I going to 78.11 on the first round? Why? So why did we go from completely empty to completely full to 78.11? And actually find, just find L, how many matches? There is something wrong. There is something wrong in here. Okay, so 7811 is the number of else. So 7811 is the correct number. So this is correct. Something goes wrong later. I think. How. Wait. How can it go wrong later? Also, 7811 is the maximum number of seats that can can even be occupied. I'm a moron for the last time. Look, I changed all the seat things to, to what it was supposed to be. So meaning checking the prep thing and I didn't do it here. And I was and I was uh, get, relying on the whatever freaking value was in undefined. OK, now this makes sense. Yes. Um, yeah, now I need to remove my custom stuff. Hi, Belginul. Hello. Okay, we haven't fixed much, actually. <laughs> we have fixed something. Okay. I was checking earlier. Is there any other place where, where I'm checking the wrong thing and, and I keep doing it? 
Oh, wait, and if it's floor, I'm a moron again. If it's floor, I have to set the new copy to floor. I have to set the new copy to floor. You know what would, would have made it much easier? If I just copied prev onto next, if instead of setting it to undefined, if I just copied prev onto next, I would not have encountered any of these problems because at this point I could have done, well, no, here I would have need to do, to use prev for sure, but some of the others, I could have used them interchangeably. So here's the other problem then now, uh, that if it's, if it's floor, then seat star, we need to set everything every single time is floor, but this is, this is not a transformation. This is just, um, setting the right, the cell to the right value. So I think that now this is correct. Now we write, we write here, we write here, we write here, we write all the three states. And what about here? I think here we need to write two. And here we need to write that it is whatever it was before. So I think my optimizations really, really mess with me. I think we're not there though. We still have some noise. We are not converging still. Why are we not converging? Oh, I know why. Because actually, actually, this needs to happen not just if it's 1, 3. This needs to happen in any case that we didn't apply any rule. So if not changed, we need to do this. Actually, let's, let's get rid of this stuff, I guess. Put it on a single line. Okay. And I think now I should have finally covered all the cases or not <laughs> okay um if we apply a rule you know what let's change this also to something different let's let's do it preemptively right off the bat we write in the new seat whatever previous value was there in prev and we we should never be reading from seat are we reading from seat anywhere no 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 okay so we are not reading from seat which is fine and we always start by setting it to prev uh Okay, so there was still, I think we finally converged to the actual final thing. How long did it take to converge? Oh, I wish I knew. I like it converges immediately. Um, oof. So the problem is that by even putting it here, there, were, there was a case where this was not happening. Why, where? How? Oh, I know why. It's it's not that. It's the count that was no. I have no idea. So, and by the way, we don't even know for sure if that is correct. But uh, let's make it let's make it reach unreachable code. Yes, that's my unreachable final count twenty four twenty four. So it took it 93 loops to get there. See if the number is right. Might not even be. Holy cow. That's the right answer. Oh shit, that's part two. <laughs> yes. Small detail. As soon as people started to arrive, you realize your mistake. People don't just care about adjacent seats. They care about the first seat they can see in each of these eight directions. Now, instead of considering just the eight immediately adjacent seats, you 
Consider the first seed in each of those eight directions. For example, the empty seed below would see eight occupied seeds. Oh shit, I had so much trouble with the first part already. Oh no, this is gonna murder me. So these empty seeds would see eight occupied seeds. One, two, wait, are we going, holy shit, we are, we are walking diagonally. Oh shit, okay. The leftmost empty seat below would, on, would only see one empty seat, but cannot see any of the other occupied ones. The empty seat below would see no occupied seats. <laughs> Here comes the rate of bounce. Yeah, I can already smell them too. Oh shit, okay. Also, pro also, people seem to be more tolerant than you expected. It now takes five or more visible occupied seats for any occupied seat to become empty rather than two or more. The other rules still apply. Empty seats that see no occupied seats become occupied, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? I, I removed all the stupid, like, computer science-y bugs of undefined memory and stuff, which actually I really called this upon myself. I should have gone for the easier thing where I copy everything over and fuck it. But anyway, my fault. Um, but now that I removed those, I think... I think we can do better. So given, given, I mean, for the second half, given the starting layout as above, these new rules cause the seating area to shift around as follows, blah, 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 blah. Again, at this point, people stop shifting around and the end is 20, say, 26 occupied seats. So again, once the group is reached, how many seats end up occupied? So now the rules are a bit more complicated. It's not just this list of operation. These now are like directions and we need to follow the direction. Okay, so Oof. So how do we do this? I think we only need to change honestly, I think we really only need to change this, this part here inside the neighbors, how we compute the thing. We just need one more layer. What we do here is um, for each operation, which is now a direction, for each direction, we need to keep following the direction until we hit a border. So, I guess we need to initialize X and Y by moving one step in that direction and the check now it's a while and while while these things hold true so while we can still make a move this is going to be interesting so while we can still make a move we keep moving forward in the direction. So what does it mean? Keep keeping on moving forward. It means uh, it means applying the rules here again at the end, but not on X and Y. Uh, sorry, not on I and J, but on Y and X directly. So we keep moving X and Y, and then we check if we can move again. And now. We switch over what we see there, and if it's if it's occupied, we add one. If it's empty, uh, you know what? Let me make a change. Now this switch is different because now we do n plus equals one, and, and I think I don't need the stupid cast anymore, because this is gonna be fine. If it's empty, we do n plus equals one. Uh, so if it's occupied, we do this. If it's empty, we do nothing. If it's floor, if it's floor, 
we kind of continue, but you can see that this is not happening anymore. So we can do this. If it's, it's floor, we move the cursor, like we follow the direction and then we continue. Otherwise, we, and by continue, we are continuing the while loop. Otherwise, we break. Does this make sense? So let me see. There are multiple ways of writing this, but the idea is we, we take a step in, in the direction that we want to follow. Is this a valid position? If it is, then we check that cell. If the cell is, let's start with floor, right? Because, because floor means we don't, we don't do any change to the count, but we need to continue. So if it's floor, we keep stepping and then we try the loop again. If it's empty, we don't add no, we don't add anything to n. If it's occupied, we add one. If we haven't hit the floor continue thing, we break. There are probably much better ways of expressing this. But um, also maybe yeah, I think this should be like this. Um, okay. Uh, so this should produce in the end. This should actually produce in the end what we want. Now the difference is that it was it wasn't four anymore. It was five, right? So let me see how this changed with the five thing. People seem to be more tired than expected. It now takes five or more visible occupied seats for a seat to become empty. So now this is from one to four, and that's it. Oh God, what did I do? Oops, I cleared chat. <laughs> Why is this taking precedence over this every single time I tap? Oh no, it's not every single time. I just touched it. That's my fault. <laughs> Let's see. Midday 11, expected something. Um, oh yeah, this switch is not an expression anymore. Next, user on the client notified OP. Uh, right, now uh, let's call it dear, I guess. This is the direction we're moving towards. Then day 11 following command ended unexpectedly. Failed with exit code 11. Oh no, are we hitting a compiler error? Please, no, please. No compiler errors, no compiler bugs, please. Oh God, um, sig build v forward slash day. 11.zig. <laughs> I'm meeting a segmentation fault. <laughs> okay, so why are we segmentation faulting? Um, we are segmentation faulting because I'm continuing and breaking inside an inline four. <sighs> it's fine. Yeah, ouch. Oh no, and because I cleared, I can't see who's, who's written ouch. <laughs> uh, can I do page up? Oh yeah, I can still do page up, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I guess this four cannot be an inline four anymore. And now we do, we need to do this properly. So this is now going to become, basically here I was using CompTIME metaprogramming to do a like duct typing around this thing, which like the inline four was, was becoming this set of, of things, basically copy pasted. You can, not exactly like that, but you can think of it conceptually speaking as copy pasting this block multiple times once for each element here. And now I guess we need to make this a proper array of uh, numbers, I don't know. Um, how do we make them? Let's make them my 16s. Um, now this is an array of tuples of couples of i16s. I think these should automatically coerce to these. So all these anonymous things, these before were tuples, but now these should become arrays. Oh well, the compiler will tell me if if the 
if this is a problem. Uh, Virginal, save the code that crashes the compiler. Uh, well, I can tell you 99% it's the continue and break stuff inside a, a, an inline four. So now this is a proper normal uh, array and this should now, whoops, and of course, I did the wrong thing. This should now work, yeah, now it builds. So now I can actually run the code. Final count, 2208, and then reached my unreachable code here. Let's see, is this correct? That's the right answer. So it turns out that phase two was actually much easier, especially when you don't murder yourself by depending on undefined memory because you're a moron. <laughs> so I guess my biggest enemy in today's um, advent of code was actually myself. Um, yeah, that was fairly easy. I have to say, this was fairly easy in good part because I ended up going in a direction that the designers of this challenge expected. Actually, I'll, I'll say a little bit more. I think that it, what I did was kind of the right thing to do in a more absolute sense, but I might still be wrong about this. But what is certainly true is that I structure my code in a way that the, the creators of the puzzle expect them to structure it. So I think that we I've seen enough exercises to see that they kind of give you the face, uh, the most of the time, the second star is, uh, yes, adding a layer of complexity over the previous solution, but it usually doesn't require you to restructure everything. It's just a addition on a specific key piece of the code. And if you keep that key piece of the code um, self-contained, then you don't have to modify much. And that was my case, right? Here I had this, I knew that computing the neighbors was a particular sub procedure. I didn't iso isolate it in a, in a function, but I did isolate it in a block. And so I knew that basically, 99% of the changes that I needed to make to my code would have been inside this block. And um, and actually, it's funny how my if could become a while. And I say funny, but it's not. It's actually by design. I think that the, the designers of this exercise said, oh, look, we can make them flip the if to a while. And that's nice. Then I hit a compiler second fault. But hey, that's life. <laughs> Oh, I needed to change a lot of stuff to get the second done. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess um, if you didn't have it self-contained like this, uh, that that makes sense. Well, um, I hope I hope this was um, a good learning experience for everyone involved. I guess lesson number one: if you set something to undefined memory, you should not try to depend on it. You should not try to read it. And I think that this is gonna improve in the future because what I was every single place where I was trying to read undefined memory like when I was doing this in the beginning Valgrind can tell you that you are depending on undefined memory and I would expect in the future I would expect in the future maybe to Zig have a mode where it can add a, a runtime check to tell you if this is happening Maybe it's not possible, but in any case, maybe I should just learn to use Valgrind. Um, but checking that you are re that you are depending on undefined memory can be automa uh, automatized by tools. So, like debuggers, uh, Valgrind more precisely, can tell you can if you set undefined. So the idea of undefined inside of Zig, when you set something to undefined. It's one way for you to say I don't want to spend the time of initializing this memory, but it's also a way that Zig can communicate to Valgrind and similar tools that this memory has not been written to yet. And this way, Valgrind can tell you that you're doing something 100% dumb. If I in, so, for example, if this was another language uh, and I initialized everything to zero, which would uh, like like uh, think of this being Go, I just initialize uh, these two, like I do an empty array and uh, it automatically gets zeroed. If it gets zeroed, like the zero value for the, is, this enum is probably going to be floor. So everything is floor. And I would still kind of have the same similar problems, not exact the same type of, what can I say, variable behavior that you get from undefined because from undefined you can get also garbage memory. 
um, or more precisely, in this case, I think it also gets set to zero AA, which then I don't know how that ends up mapping to the enum in any case. Um, but in that case, Valgrind would have, or similar tools would have not have been able to tell me that I was actually reading something that I had never written to, which is 100% systematically wrong. So Undefined is a useful tool. Uh, it's just that uh, the way I was compiling and running the executable, I could not leverage it fully. That was the missing piece. That and a bit of brain. You should not just read Undefined behavior, uh, sorry, um, Undefined memory. Because that leads to undefined behavior. Uh, another thing is, uh, so yeah, I, I guess it's just that in my mind I was using c.star as a shortcut and I wasn't thinking explicitly that I needed to check prev. Even though I realized it here and I put it first try, I put prev in here. Yeah, there, there'll be dragons. Well, in this case, not many dragons. I mean, here, I guess, normally speaking, you're going to get a um, a random a random case of the enum, but uh, like if this array was much, much bigger, uh, and if this array wasn't um, stack allocated, but it was heap allocated, I think you could even get a seg fault because you're trying to read memory that, um, that you're not being given. I mean, maybe it won't happen, but it could, but it's something that a compiler could legitimate make happen because again you're not supposed to be reading memory that you haven't initialized and so the compiler could have for example decided to say well i'm not gonna request that extra page of memory until you write to it i don't know something like this it's probably never going to happen in in, in this particular implementation but that's one of the things that could happen uh when you are incurring undefined behavior because the compiler if it's undefined behavior you're not supposed to do it so the compiler is a, is allowed to make even weird transformations that don't make um, semantical sense otherwise. Um, my take on undefined is that it can be super useful, but you really have to be careful and check everything twice. Yeah, I agree. Or you, or you know what? You, you should be running Valgrind, I guess. Uh, it would be nice if, if we had a like, built-in Valgrind D th runtime thing, kind of like um, unreachable is checked at runtime. It would be nice if every time you read something that i don't know maybe it's hard because pointers and pointer math make it uh, make it exceedingly hard um maybe we should just have a run debug flag and you normally ex are expected to run everything in run debug and you get like a the executable automatically run within while grind i have no idea uh maybe it's, i just need to do it myself and in any case, uh, yeah, reading undefined memory, bad idea. Um, and the problem that happened because in my mind, I was not always properly distinguishing between prev and next. I had it clear in my mind here. I didn't have it clear in my mind in other places. Like here, that was embarrassing. Here I was checking and then writing. Oh, you know what? Oh, here's the thing. Because originally I wasn't checking. Originally I was just writing, right? Oh, sorry, but I did have this. And then I realized, oh shit, no, that's wrong. Because I, I'm not changing every single time. I'm writing, yes, but I'm not necessarily changing. And then I added this thing, but then I was, mm, I was lazy. And I just put sit there instead of the, the correct thing. Um, but hey, I guess that's life. So that was a fun exercise today. Um, lucky the bug assert. Yeah, it would be it would be nice to have something like this. Uh, the problem is I don't know how how feasible it is. I really don't know how feasible it is, honestly, because it's not just so undefined sets everything to AA, sets next basically fills next with A's. But you can just say here, so let's say that I'm the compiler adding the, the runtime check right here. I can just say if c.star, uh, c.star, I don't know, uh, uh, but c.star, but like, uh, I, uh, let, let me make something magic uh, very, uh, very quickly, like as bytes. The, 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 this thing doesn't exist and it would need more more settings, but like s bytes uh seed state 
seed. Uh, and if I check that uh, that this is, I don't know, at his all A's. <laughs> so if, if I had something like this right in the compiler, and then here we do uh, panic, uh, reading, undefined memory. Now, the reason why this doesn't just work is because something could be legitimately just A's. Oh, you didn't know about the A's. Yeah, that's how, that's how uh, it's also useful. Like if you're debugging something and you read the, um, and you take a peek at what the state uh, of the value of something is, if it's a bunch of A's, if you expect it to be something, but if it's a bunch of A's, um, then you can, sus you can have a reasonable suspicion that this is a, uh, uninitialized memory in the bug mode. Only in the bug mode, this gets written to A's though. In run, in, uh, release uh oh in release safe and release fast this is actually dirty memory so you will see you will have garbage for real yeah but it's not just in one case but yeah there are cases where a is actually a correct number so uh, a correct value so this is not a would not be a correct check and i'm pretty confident that what what while grind does is keep track of each chunk of memory that exists each chunk of memory, or more precisely, sorry, it keeps track of each chunk of memory that you write to, each pointer that you write to, and then every time you're reading from a pointer, it double checks if it's a pointer that you've wrote to or not. And it's even more complicated than that, right? Because it's not just the exact pointer that you've wrote to, because I could be mem copying a range of an array, so I'm writing to the initial pointer, but I'm writing length of data to it. So it needs to be, it needs to keep track of basically slices of memory that you wrote to, and then it needs to check that you're only reading from within a correct slice range. So there is a bunch of runtime stuff that Valgrind has to do. Can Zig do that in debug mode? I guess, maybe, but the problem is that this is so complicated that it kind of introduces a runtime because it's not just like a pinpoint check anymore. It's something based on some state that has to exist somewhere. And I think this would introduce a bunch of other problems in the language when in, in terms of interoperating with C libraries and stuff. So I don't think, um, now that I thought about it uh, more thoroughly, I don't think the Z compiler can easily, it doesn't make sense, I think, for the Z compiler to check that. Uh, you could change the value for an optional in the compiler. Let me think about this. You could. You could. I guess. I think he, I think at the first glance, it, it can work out. It will introduce a bunch of complexity though, because then the compiler needs to, yeah, it needs to introduce secret unwraps everywhere where it checks for this stuff. Unwraps that you didn't put there. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, Sebastian. Um, <laughs> on two marks of mullet one, nice. Um, wait, mullet? You mean, do you call it like this or is it like, I think I always call it muled wine. Oh, by the way, where, where are you from, Sebastian? Uh, or maybe this is just autocorrect, I don't know. Oh, with a D, okay, so it's just a type, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, I just was curious if, uh, oh, from Germany, okay. So I, I was just curious if um, maybe where you were from, uh, people called it slightly in a slightly different way, which happens sometimes, I think. Um, so yeah, I don't know. The optional thing is, is intriguing, actually. It would still be a problem if people are doing bit fiddling stuff with arrays and, and thing and stuff, but you are not supposed to do bit fiddling stuff or enums because enums do not have a a memory layout. Uh, you would have to use an extern enum. This is an enum with a well-defined uh, memory layout, which allows you to do uh, you know bit fiddling stuff to it and um, and do things. 
But hey, that's a good point. Or you know what? It, it doesn't even have to be uh, an optional. I mean, yeah, it could. In a sense, it could be an option, but in another sense, it could be like uh, maybe the compiler just has an invalid um, case to each enum, and then every time, every time we, we switch and check, every time there is a switch, every time there is an if, it secretly inserts a if it's invalid panic. That, that's basically your idea, just slightly implemented in a slightly different way. You know, that can be done. Although this solves for enums, uh, it doesn't solve for other cases. Or you could abuse the pointer as LVM does. There are some news bits in each pointer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, depends on, on the architecture, I guess. Um, but yeah, for normal architectures, that's the case. So that's another possibility. I don't know. That's that's going to be interesting for the future. I don't think this is something that the Zig project can work on, should prioritize uh, right now. But um, for the future, I think I think there will be have to be a point where uh, we have we focus more on on this type of of things like uh, better error reporting and better error checking. So it's an interesting thought. Well, uh, thank you for the discussion. This was interesting. Uh, almost two hours. Ouch. Uh, well, I think we spent, what, 20 minutes now by uh, talking, so it took me more than one hour to do everything I, I fear. That's just life. Um, but hey. Um, that's good. So thank you, everyone, for watching. And I think uh, see you all tomorrow at usual time, so two hours ago at eight for, I guess, advent of code day 12. They are getting harder. They are getting a bit harder. Although I think that the worst one took me like three hours in total. It was the parsing one, which was a, a parsing madness. I think these are harder, but more manageable, especially when you stop reading from undefined memory, which is never read from undefined memory. I should make t-shirts like, uh, about this stuff <laughs> yeah anyway uh yeah thank you for the stream uh you're welcome thank you for watching so see you all tomorrow bye bye